to another in hybrid meeting of our seminar. And today, our very distinguished speaker that we're very happy to have is uh, Boris Aronov, one of the organizers of our seminar, <laughs> professor of computer science at NYU. And uh, I, I don't know him very well. I don't know what else to say. That is not sort of a review of past stuff. Is joint work with. Uh... Oh, oh, oh. Miss Holmes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's joint work with Sangha and Jugaral, Esther Ezra, Matthew Cuts, and Michael Schmidt. Okay. Um, I assume no one can read that. So. Uh, people who are on Zoom, uh, if you have any complaints, please tell them to us. Otherwise, we might miss it. For example, if there's no sound at some point. Yes, shout very loudly if you can't hear us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. So let me try to tell you what is it that um, I want to tell you about, and then I'll give you a little bit of background. It's necessarily very, very sketchy. Well, I want, and um, so I want to apologize in advance. There's lots of technical detail, all of which I will skip. Um, I will hand wave a lot. Um, the paper appeared, so I actually was staring at it today. And it has a lot of more information that I'm able to, to cover today. So, um, so first, a little bit of motivation. So what we want to talk about is these things called intersection queries. So you have some sort of um, objects, uh, yeah, I input objects. And um, my running example is going to be triangles, triangles in three dimensions. Uh, basically, everything we did in this paper is in three dimensions. Um, in principle, the method would work elsewhere, but we didn't uh, explore that. Uh, we worked on a lot more than just triangles. This would just be a running example, not to give everyone a major headache. So. And then what are the queries? Um, the queries right? But the running example is going to be circular. Okay, so what am I talking about? Well, let me try to draw it. So this may or may not be the only three-dimensional picture I will attempt to draw. Um, you will see soon why. So you have a bunch of triangles floating around in space. I don't think we assume that as usual, there are N of them. This will always be N. Um, in order to facilitate certain kinds of queries and uh, the, the kind I'm talking about, are going to be, you have a circle in three dimensions, and you decide that this arc of the circle is somehow, let's see, so this is all happening in 3D. This is a flat circle, oriented any way you like. And uh, maybe, maybe you want to give it uh, as a query. And what do you want to get back? The generic term intersection query. Um, uh, but I would actually use in all this, the different uh, setups that we can, um, all the different setups that we can handle. Uh, there are actually three kinds of uh, queries. There is counting query, where the answer would be there are three triangles intersecting. There's actually a little bit of subtlety. Um, sometimes we, you count um, how many objects you intersect, and sometimes you count how many intersection points are. So for example, the circle can intersect some triangle twice. So I will stay away from that. 
Um, so counting is one, reporting is the other, meaning uh, this arc uh, intersects these two triangles and I want to list them. Or the answer is a single bit, yes or no. Does this arc intersect any of the triangles or not? Okay, I will most of the time focus on the detection because it's just easier to describe. Um, essentially, with very small modifications, the entire framework works in any of them. Obviously, in reporting, you also have to pay for the things you, re you uh, return. So you, you may return the entire set. You have to pay for that. But, um, and in fact, I think most of what I'm going to tell you will actually work for more or less any not too crazy to be high. Uh, algebraic arcs. There are more papers, uh, more papers. There are more results in the paper. Um, we can actually do the reverse where the input objects are curves and the queries are triangles or other flat things. Or we can actually do triangles versus triangles or disks versus disks or whatever. It turns out that we actually need to do this in order to make the final thing work, but uh, I will stay away from that. So if you wanted to code this, you could code it as a bipartite graph where you uh, consider one set of objects, one set of vertices and the other set of objects, the other. And... If you were given the queries ahead of time, so the triangles are given to you ahead of time, and then the arcs come as queries independently. And um, so maybe I should say this actually, um, the parameters I want to focus on is, S, which stands for space, um, Q, which stands for query time, and there is also pre-processing, which is P, but I will mostly ignore it because in most of what we're going to do is going to be comparable with the space, so I'm not going to dwell on it. There is a lot of prior history here. I am in no position to even try to summarize it. Um, I may mention a few results a bit later, but maybe I want to mention a few. Do I want to do that first or not? Yeah. The input is specified as uh, real numbers, and you assume that all computations kind of capable of handling real numbers, or is this could you think of them as integers? And, and you'll ask a very good and very dangerous question. The dangerous part, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, it's really only about you. Okay, so we like to think that we are working in real RAM, meaning that the inputs are reals, mm -hmm. but in fact, it's not quite right because along the way, we're going to do certain things to polynomials. And if you read the fine print on those algorithms, you either need to write them down in bits or you need to assume that you work in certain real certain rings which are basically extensions of the rationals you know like rationals and standard with square root of two or something but you cannot work on arbitrary reals because there's no way to write them down uh, so we certainly don't just stay away stay within adding multiplying dividing real numbers we do some other stuff okay so i would prefer to stop at this in describing our computation uh, assumptions on the computation in fact we were just discussing exactly this question what is it that we need in space then it would be the number of numbers that we have to store and the query would be the number of yeah so I'm, my assumption operations. is i'm not counting bits so for example a triangle has three vertices each vertex in 3d is specified by three numbers so each triangle would be slightly restricted they're not really full-blown reals Okay. Okay, so let's see. So let me first do like a very high level introduction um, to a very big hammer in range searching. Okay, so the way this is phrased, it's not range searching. Okay, it's traditional range searching is more along the lines of um, there is a bunch of points, and I want to. And then I give you some region, and I want to know which points are in the region. Okay, and there is also sort of the inverse operation, where instead I give you a bunch of region, and then the query is a point, and uh, is there called point enclosure queries when I want to return which things enclose a given. Um, so let me uh, remind you of uh, two hammers if you haven't seen them before. Uh, so. 
So let's assume for a second that our objects, and I apologize for the notation, objects are specified by T all uh, uh, parameters. So for triangles, it would be nine because these are the nine coordinates of the three endpoints uh, vertices of the triangle. Okay. Um, and let me also assume that the queries are specified, were chosen to be interchangeable because you can't tell which one is O and which one is Q, but they aren't supposed to be. And uh, if you just do it brute force, um, circular arcs in 3D are specified by some ridiculous number of parameters. Okay, let's try counting them. Um, for example, you can specify the plane, they text three parameters. Uh, three more is the center and the radius, so that's six. And also two more to specify where you start and where you end. So that okay, so let me now um, remind you or introduce you to a very standard hammer, which usually produces ridiculous results, but at least it tells you that the problem is solvable in principle, which is the following. So you can work either in object space, which is basically or with um, as many dimensions as you need to store the objects. Okay. So if you do that, what happens is uh, this is your object space. And then the triangle becomes a point. So our running example is R9. That's a nine becomes a region. So what region, what am I talking about? Well, for every query, just imagine some triangles intersected and some don't. And because I didn't say this, but this is a combination of a small number of polynomial equalities and inequalities, the condition that the triangle intersects a specific arc maps to a region in uh, in the space. So triangles that correspond to intersecting the result. And I think I did it backwards. Right. Okay, so um, queries correspond to regions. And therefore, I'm now, this is a point in clover form. In our, our, our nine for triangle because I store and uh, regions, uh, well, once I decide, so just to be clear, I, in order to build the data structure, I need to know what kind of algebraic arcs. It's not arbitrary algebraic arcs, but I decide that let's say they're circular arcs. And if I do, then they are specified by eight parameters or whatever it is. And each arc corresponds to a certain kind of a region. And I pre-process, I build a data structure for range searching with these regions in nine dimensions. There is machinery for this. I'm not going to scare you with the, what comes out of this machinery, but uh, this line, this exponent shows up prominently in there. The higher the exponent, the, exponent, the more trouble. Unsurprisingly. Okay. So this is working in object space. And here we end up with small enclosure queries. And now we're going to talk about the other version where you work in query space. In query space, a query is a point in R DP. And now an object, which is a triangle, is a region. What region? Well, it's exactly the same kind of uh, idea. There is some relation between the point um, there is a relation between um, the arc and the triangle that makes them intersect. And here we basically viewed the parameters of the triangle as a point, and the other thing is a region. And here we swap zero. <clears throat> so for each query, which um, 
would be a cycle we draw as a region corresponding to all the triangles of intersect. Okay. So, which means that now we have n regions in R QQ. Well, they can't be both point and closure quarries. One, one of them has to be the other kind. The first one is I think the first one is yes. Okay. This is range because you have a uh, query turns into a region and you want to know which points are in the region. My apologies. Okay. And here, this is uh, the point. In I can give you a, a little bit of an idea of what happens here. This is a bit complicated, so I'm not sure I really want to. Yeah, but for point enclosure, you need the points in the beginning. You preprocess the points, right? And then, oh no, you, you preprocess the region. Yeah. Yes, I preprocess the regions. Okay. So I can explain this. Um, so this, this is a 2D version. I'm not going to try drawing in nine dimensions. Well, so this is one region. This is another region. This is the third region. Conceptually, I can just build the arrangement. And then for every point in the phase in the arrangement of any dimension I like, if I can find which phase I'm in, I know the answer. I know if I'm in any of the objects, or how many objects, so I can report the objects or whatever. Okay, so the arrangement complexity, assuming, and I'm assuming everywhere, is that these objects are fixed complexity. So a triangle is um, you know it only has uh, three vertices and three edges and this thing is only a single arc it can't be arbitrarily complicated so these are constant complexity objects and therefore the arrangements here uh, have roughly the complexity n to the t q okay and everything works out ideally and there's actually a lot of footnotes here it's not quite it doesn't work so easily if this is not two or three or four. <laughs> but ideally, you would like to just build this arrangement, preprocess it for point location, and then on something like logarithmic time, you can answer the question. Of course, um, this suggests that the space is going to be something like n to the t. And the query is going to be something like logarithmic. Okay. And it turns out that you can actually, so that's another issue that uh, pops up all the time, is the question whether or not you can do trade-off. So this is one extreme, lots of space, very fast query, and the other extreme is nearly in your space. Can you make the query sublinear and how sublinear you can make? It's usually n to some power. Okay, so I, could in principle throw that stuff at you, but I think I will never get to the subject of this talk if I do. Okay, so these are two sort of standard hammers. And just to focus on two things here. First of all, notice the, the number of parameters shows up in the exponent. So the higher it is, the more horrible the results are. So you want to sort of Stay away from that as much as you can. Okay. For your first for the for the range search, have you done was that also n to the t zero space and then log in first time? I'd rather not say okay, but in spirit something <laughs> like this. Like in spirit, something like this. I, I I don't want to get I don't want to state things which I'll try it false. I don't really know sort of the high level meta results on range searching where very, very many and depends they depend on the flavor and the phase of the moon and stuff like this so, yeah so for this i believe we actually have an algorithm that does this recently not quite log polylog using some polynomial partitioning hammering all right so maybe it's time to actually mention this polynomial partitioning stuff okay so a really quick introduction polynomial methods have been used in all sorts of subjects but in discrete geometries, they arrived maybe a little bit over 10 years ago. There was this result by Lewis and Katz, uh, which I guess was posted in 10 or 11 or something, 10, and actually appeared in 15. 
And what it says is the following. Uh, let's say you have a point set. Uh, let's say it's in the D dimensions. And someone gives you a constant parameter. Well, actually, it doesn't need to be constant. It's any integer. Um, and then what uh, follows is that there, exists, there always exists a polynomial of D parameters, which is not zero. And let me not mention it ever again. My polynomial is never zero. So that the zero set of the polynomial. So if I take the entire space and say subtract the zero set, the zero set is simply the points in the space where the polynomial is zero. Um, this gets split into uh, roughly big D to the little d uh, connected components. This is roughly by which I mean there are constants involved, which I'm not writing, so that each contains at most n over d to the d. And again, there is a missing constant. Yeah. So roughly speaking, it splits the space as even it splits the space into pieces, so that each piece contains um, the point that is divided as evenly as possible. What's swept under the rug and actually causes an infinite amount of trouble is that the, some of the points may live on the zero, <clears throat> and we have no control whatsoever. But I will very happily sweep this under the rug for the duration of this talk. Uh, so the requisite picture, this is a plane. This is a zero set of my polynomial. Yes, there is a polynomial to zero set which like this. And so this would be one region would be another region, and the outside would be a third region, and I will call them sets. Okay, the polygist will have a heart attack, but they'll call themselves the same. Okay, and um, now is the time to reorient the amazing device. Check if I have an operation. It's the degree of the polygon. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention the important part. The degree of D is at most. That's where D goes into the recipe. Or looks F and P are the same. Yes. In fact, it's not P. It's F because P is a set of points. And other than that, okay. So yeah, how, would you, how would you understand? It's just an integer. It's a given. Oh, it's just a These two things are given to you. When D is large enough, this becomes ridiculous. Because um, the only way to satisfy the condition is to put all the points on on the zero set. So at some point, you know, with D large enough, you don't really want it. It doesn't really make sense. So, um, should we think of D as being a function of A, or should we rather? Okay, so being, uh, this is an excellent question. D can be absolutely anything. Okay, it could be. In principle, it could be n, but it's kind of ridiculous because if you said to be n, then you just uh, just put them all on the right. And even in much smaller, in fact, d to the power of one over d or something is enough to just have the polynomial pass through everything. Um, why is this an amazing question? Not just because uh, you're good at asking amazing questions, but it also matches what I was going to do. There are lots of applications where people play with what this D is, but for our application, you'll see in a second why, D is going to be a ridiculously large constant. Okay, In principle, it could be anything, but for us, it's going to be a constant. I'll explain in a second why, because otherwise we're in deep trouble. Okay, so let me do two things now in different corners of the room. Why couldn't you order two copies of the No, that's a horrible song. <laughs> okay, there is a generalization of this by Larry Gillett from 15, I believe, for which I will write a very special case because we don't need a more fancy case, but it's actually more general than that. I'll let L destruction be a collection of N, say, curves. Um, algebraic bounded degree. If you want, you can think of them as lines. 
but it actually applies to more fancy things. Exactly the same setup, except that uh, you start with a bunch of curves. You again have a parameter D. You live in R little v. Um, there is always a polynomial with a degree at most d, so that each cell of R d minus d out meets at most and over big D to the little d minus one. So there is still the number of such cells is roughly um, still big D to the little d. Sorry about this notation, but. So in principle, it's very similar. Um, and it's easy by back of the envelope calculation that this is exactly the best you can uh, possibly hope for. Because uh, if you look at a curve, uh, for the place, let's pretend it's a line. Um, this is a degree D polynomial. And therefore, on this line, it may have at most d roots. Therefore, a line will only show up in something like d or d plus one cells. And this is the minus one. Okay. So the number of places a line shows up is um, d rather than one. And therefore, you have the discrepancy d and d here. It's the d minus one there. Okay. Um, a computer scientist would, should, at this point, stop, start jumping up and down because um, these are all existential things. They say there is such polynomial, but where do I find one? Okay, it turns out that this theorem actually comes with an algorithm, but an algorithm you don't really want to use. It involves uh, doing ham sandwich cuts in high dimensions. And in high enough dimension, the ham sandwich cut is. Um, and in high dimensions, so Heim sandwich kind of so expensive. So people have figured out how to do this approximately right, meaning you get the same order of magnitude, but you can do this constructively. Okay. So this can be done constructively. There is a paper by Anderwal Matushik in Sharia, where for all practical purposes, as this can be constructed in um, somewhat ridiculously efficient way. If you look at the actual proof of the theory, okay, which of course raises a question of uh, how will the computer move here? And what do you do here? And for a while, uh, no one knew how to do this. If you look at the proof, uh, the proof is decidedly not constructive. There's, it's not just topology, but there's all sorts of stuff along the way. I, I don't want to make like outright claims. Maybe it could be turned into a, an algorithm, but it wasn't obvious. So after some hopping and puffing, actually I was involved in turning, I have this amazing cheat sheet. So just skipping some details because uh, we, there is a result of mine, um, Pankaj Jagarwal, Esther, Ezra, and um, George Zoll from some year, from 21 which basically says that we can construct this close enough. And also in sort of ridiculously efficient way, if we don't want a verification, in fact, we can run in time uh, linear in the input size. In fact, we don't even look at the input, basically. We pick a random sample of the input and then do some total, something totally ridiculous with the sample. Um, so why should D be Perhaps a constant, because now let me show you another hammer, and maybe at some point I should start getting to the point. So everyone has time until midnight, right? <laughs> a few minutes late, so yes. you can blame us and ask to finish a, a few minutes late. Well, I think a quick summary of this paper will take about three hours. So. <laughs> I doubt it, but thank you for reminding me. I should really speak faster, I guess. Okay, let me try to explain what we actually do. 
So this was inspired by an earlier paper of um, Esther Ezra and Mitha Shamir uh, that looked at the following problem. It's sort of a classic. We have a bunch of triangles and triangles in 3D. And you want to do the so called ray shooting. So, what is ray shooting? The query is someone gives you a point in a direction, also not three, and you want to know what is the first thing is. So, this is uh, used, for example, um, by graphics people and what they call ray tracing, but um, the algorithmic problem behind it is in computational geometry usually called ray shooting. So, it turns out that, in fact, this problem. There is a classic reduction of this to segment intersection via parametric search. So all you need to do is, uh, given a segment, be able to tell whether the segment intersects the triangles or not. Intuitively, you're trying to find the shortest segment so that if you make it any shorter, it doesn't intersect anything. If you make it um, exactly this length, it intersects one of the triangles. Okay. Um, so what did they do? Well, to make a long story short, I talked about these uh, strange exponents um, popping up, having to do with um, the number of parameters involved. Okay, so in previous work, um, uh, after much work uh, the problem was reduced to something that had to do with lines in three dimensions even though they live in three dimensions lines are actually four dimensional objects you can spell out spell them you can specify a line by four parameters for example if it's not a horizontal line you draw two planes and you specify its point of intersection with the first and second plane so that gives you four parameters so there, there's a whole body of work that talks about various things related to lines and um and here they somehow managed to get it to three. Okay, so their work was an improvement. I think roughly the order what they did is they managed to get uh, square root as a query and n to the three in house as a space. But there's some strings attached to this result. It's not a full trade off, but, uh, but in any case, well, the magic three here is uh, somehow related to working in three dimensions. So one original motivation for what we were doing was uh, simply being kind of, um, all right, they can do this with straight rays. Can we do this with uh, curved rays? <laughs> Literally, this is what we asked. And now we ended up with this paper that contains I don't know. The last version I looked at had a table with 11 results in it. And um, I don't dare tell you exactly what is it we figured out, but I'll try to give you the tools. Actually, maybe I can give you at least one of the results. Okay, so let me show you the idea. So what we built is a certain kind of a partition. So the input is a bunch of triangles. And what we do is we fix the ridiculously large what constant um, D. And then we find one of these polynomials. So fine. If all of them on the left, such that each cell of R D are three. We're in three dimensions, minus the zero set of L um, meets at most and the number of triangles of them, 
n over t squared with some constant. Where did I get this from? Well, triangle edges. So I want to distinguish the property where an edge of a triangle means Okay. I'll tell you what the motivation is, and then we'll wear the trouble. Oh, so it's not about how many it's cells not, intersect the triangle. It's the not triangle. how many triangles meet the cell, it's how many triangle edges meet the cell. We ignore, I mean, for the purposes of this construction, for the first step, the triangles themselves are ignored, only the edges are. And the same kind of an argument works with any kind of shapes. Um, I guess we need flat shapes, meaning planar shapes, as long as they're bounded by something reasonable. Discs, ellipses, I don't know, heptagons. Um, okay. so, so what is the hope? And then I will have to dash your hope. The hope is as this number shrinks way quick. And what we're going to do is simply recurse on those triangles whose edges meet the cell, because this is just a smaller cell problem. But what do we do with the other ones? So some terminology, and this is my favorite cell, I will draw them like this, but they're not. So if a triangle actually goes, <coughs> intersects the cells, so this is a cell, let's call it tau, tau, and if edge of triangle meets tau, no, tau, then we say that uh, this triangle is narrow. I mean, the English, you know, if it pretends to be like a line of a number, so the edge shows up. So inside, this triangle, oh, I have colors, but I don't know how to use them anyway. So, <laughs> so here, there is a piece which lives in the cell, and it's a piece of an edge. Okay. And the other situation is something like this you have a big triangle, and you have a cell. And uh, no edges appear in the cell. The triangle sort of body intersects the cell, but the edges don't. And it's kind of tempting to say, okay, as far as the cell is concerned, uh, this uh, is a plane. Why are planes good? Because triangles are described by nine parameters, and planes are described by three. So very much happy if you can get rid of all of this nonsense with uh, the bounding lines. Unfortunately, this statement is just utterly false. This is my favorite cell. And no one says that it cannot, a cell cannot look like this. Okay, and then if my triangle decides to intersect it sort of like this, that's not a triangle. Oh, yeah. So very, very far. Uh, it can intersect the cell like that. Okay. And it kind of looks like a plane at this point, except that now I can play, play with this triangle and replace it by a triangle that looks like this. And now this triangle intersects this donut here, but not here. So it's not true that it interacts with the cell as a full plane. It is true that the boundary doesn't show up, but it's not true that I can just replace it by a plane and forget it. Okay, and this is basically the trouble. How do you deal with these guys? Okay, so these, I forgot to tell you, these are called wide triangles because their boundary doesn't show up, so they kind of look like me. Okay, but unfortunately, they can do this. Okay, so let me try to explain what's going on. Uh oh. All right, so let me give you a high level description of what is happening with the data structure. And then I will try in the remaining minus two minutes, explain 
uh, the punchline. Okay. There are examples where these cells necessarily need to be not simply connected. The way I've defined it, uh, they are simply the complement of the zero set of the polynomial. Right. So the polynomial could be the surface of the donut. Right. End of story. Right. But you will also try to prove what's wrong with here when you find a polynomial that says, uh, uh, yeah. Not of this thing. Um, in some ways, I think what we are doing is sort of in that direction, but we are using a much, much larger hammer. I'll show you what the, is the hammer. Oh, and I forgot to tell you the algorithm that I described here, which I failed to describe here, about um, finding the polynomial for curves. Um, it's linear in the size of the input. It's very much not linear and deep. The dimension of the Dependence on the degree is something ridiculous. And that's why you need D to be a constant. That's one, actually, you'll see in a second another reason why you need it to be a constant. So, as I, a high level structure is a partition tree. At the beginning, we start with R3. We build the polynomial. And then um, the thing has uh, d cubed cells, roughly. Uh, let's call the cells tau. And the tree simply has a branch for every, probably not twice to the same one. So there is um, a branch for every cell. Um, so what are we trying to do? Another thing that I'm sweeping under the rug is it could be that one of these triangles lives in the zero set, okay? And another thing I'm trying to uh, sweeping under the rug is that it could be is that one of the queries lives completely in the zero set. I'm going to cheerfully ignore all those. Um, our extremely great paper has two pages of notation on the bottom. It uses fully two or three alphabets, and you're welcome to look at it to look at the details. But pretending this doesn't happen, there is another thing I need to sweep under the rug. Someone recently proved that if you're intuitive and your objects are two dimensional, not too complicated shapes. And your queries are not too complicated. No, in fact, even for points, the stuff that we're claiming we can do is impossible, which is kind of annoying if you already have a very long paper written up about it. Um, so it turns out that if we allow our triangles, or more generally, I'm not sure if actually the lower bound applies to triangles, but our technology applies to other well behaved shapes. And lower bond, I think, is for annuli. So what we need to assume is that the queries, the, the planes, the plane doesn't have too many of these triangles. So there is some general position assumption. Hmm. Because otherwise, if we have lots of queries in the same plane as the triangles, then the lower bond applies. And uh, we've proven that 2 is equal to 3, which has widespread implications, but not what we really want to prove. So. so what do we do? Well, we use uh, this hammer. Uh, so simply here, we recurse on um, narrow triangles. Okay. But this is not good enough because we have to deal with uh, white triangles. So there is additionally a special data structure for four white triangles. So exactly how does this work? Well, and, and a query comes in, ignoring the stuff that I, we agreed to. Well, I said I will ignore. I didn't really ask your permission. Well, you have the query. 
it's an arc. It could intersect either one of these things. So what's what's the idea? The idea is that you have we live in some space. It's a three-dimensional space, but I'll draw it somehow differently. You have the arc. This zero set cuts things into pieces, these individual pieces. We just pretend that this arc is cut into these smaller pieces, and we'll deal with each of them separately. And this is like at most D or D squared or right. Like that. Right. So for space, we're actually getting something like um, D cube. And then we recurse on these narrow things. And then I have to tell you how big is this. And it turns out that I can do almost linear for my purpose. And I will tell you what it is in the non-existent remaining time. And this, roughly speaking, because this is a three and this is a two, solves to n or m to the three times. Okay. And now I have to tell you about the queries. So how do you answer queries? As you pointed out, a query only hits the zero set, assuming it's not in the zero set. That's why I had to sweep that under the rug. It only hits roughly D pieces. So the recurrence for the query is going to be something like D query of M over D squared plus whatever it is I can get out of this structure. Okay, and in the structure I was hoping and probably will not be able to describe the exponent is something like two thirds. And you can check that this is what determines in this particular case, uh, the solution is determined by this. So the query ends up being under the two thirds. You can actually speed it up for some special classes of objects. In fact, for triangles, we can do better. But the thing I'm describing right now is not really specialized to triangles. It can do almost anything. So hopefully, with a lot of hand waving, this is semi convincing, except that there is a major thing missing. I have to tell you what do you do with white triangles? How do you do it in roughly linear space and in this amount? Okay, so let me try to explain this. Unfortunately, I need another hammer that I have no time to even introduce. So the hammer is so called TAD, which stands for cylindrical. Algebraic decomposition, which was um, created, I guess, constructed by Collins. Do you remember the year 75 or something like this? Something like that. Let me try to explain what the heck it is. So you have, well, let's say, a polynomial or a bunch of polynomials. It's a recursively defined uh, thing. So in 1D, if you have a polynomial, let's say at one, then it's simply either the roots etc. And uh, the composition is simply this interval is one piece, this point is another piece, and this interval is the next piece, etc. And the idea is that in each interval, somehow the behavior is the same. So for example, the sign of my function between the roots is constant, and then something magic happens at the root, then there is everything is constant until the next root, etc. Okay. And then you define it kind of recursively, it gets complicated, but let's see if I can maybe illustrate it with that figure. Let's say you have one or several, eh, several polynomials, these are their zero sets. I'm kind of hind waving because the technical definition is a little annoying. Uh, but roughly speaking, the following thing happens. You find all the points 
and which these polynomials have common roots or have some other special properties. For example, this is a, a special point on this uh, polynomial because it's some sort of a critical point. Um, this is a point where uh, the tangent to the zero set is vertical. Um, and pictures in 2D. Yes, this is a 2D picture. I might be able to draw a 3D picture, but I don't think I want to. You project these things down to one lower dimension, in this case, one dimension. You mark these spots. You, the technical definition is a little hairier than that. But basically, you introduce a bunch of polynomials that capture this idea of either having intersections or having special points. And you project them down to the x coordinate, and you do this kind of a construction. So these are zeros of all these special polynomials. And then you lift it back up. So what happens is that you have regions in this partition, and this partition always consists of. Uh, things of various dimensions from zero up to whatever dimension you are in. So this is one dimension. So we have points and you have intervals. And over each interval or each point, what is the property we want? If we look over such a point, I missed it. If we look properly over this point, uh, we informally call it the fiber, probably not the official name. But the point is that as you look over, the pattern is the same no matter which point you pick. So, for example, um, each of the polynomials has the same number of roots. This guy has only, always one root. This guy always has two roots. Uh, they appear in the same order, et cetera, et cetera. So, something, somehow, nothing exciting happens. And the high dimensional cat is just defined recursively. So, if this was a projection of a three dimensional thing, that's you uh, over each region here, you would lift it into third dimension and again sort of split it into pieces according to uh, whatever events happen. So in 3D, in 2D, for example, each region, if it's two dimensional, always looks like this. It has a floor and a ceiling, which are algebraic functions, and it has, uh, and the ceiling is always above the floor within uh, this region. It's an open region, and sort of nothing interesting happens within. What does it mean nothing interesting happens within? It means all the functions that we ever talk about have the same sign over this entire region. So nothing ever changes. There's nothing flips from positive to negative, et cetera. Okay, so we need this hammer. And maybe now I can really quickly hand wave what we're going to do. And then hopefully I will stop that. What I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to start with myself. And now I'm going to pretend that I cut it with some plane. So now I'm going to do some very serious hand waving. And the idea is that this plane cuts the cell in a bunch of regions. And if I'm talking about the white triangle, the boundary of the triangle doesn't interfere with any of these regions. Each of these regions is either in the triangle or it's not in the triangle. Okay? Which triangle I pick, it tells me you know, whether it's in or out, but the shape of the region doesn't depend on the triangle itself. It only depends on whether it's in or out. Okay, the trouble with this is that the statement seem to depend on the actual choice of the plane. Okay, and I would like to not do this. I would like to make some general statement. I want to reduce this whole thing to some fancy range searching. And I cannot do this separately for every triangle. Because if I do it separately for every triangle, I'm using all nine coordinates of the triangle. Not good. Okay, so how do we get around this? And this is where I have to use a hammer, which is kind of scary.
Suppose we found that polynomial f. I'm going to now do the following. I'm going to consider the polynomial. And in this polynomial, I'm going to plug in. So it's a polynomial x, y, and z, right? So x, y. And here I'm going to plug in a x plus b y plus, which most people recognize as an equation of a plane. Okay. And I'm going to treat this as a five variable polynomial x, y, a, b, and c. And I'm now going to throw cabbages in five dimensions, eliminating first y, then x, then a and b and c. You would say, <laughs> well, turns out this cat has the following nice properties. It's a hierarchical thing. It's a recursive thing. I erased the helpful picture. But the point is that if you actually, if we fix A, B, and C, I erased this picture with a fiber. So the point is that if you fix three specific numbers, what happens over it it's kind of unchanging as long as these live in the same cell of the cellular integral of decomposition. So, what is it that's happened here? Well, what is actually happening is you have this plane H whose, course, whose equation is D equals AX plus B minor plus C. Since I fixed A, B, and C, this is a fixed plane. And what is really happening over it is you have the zero set. This is zero up, intersecting this plane. And it's nicely decomposed into pretty pictures according to essentially the same idea as it had before. So we have a very pretty representation here, which doesn't change as long as we wiggle A and B and C in the same cell of cat. So why is this good? Because what are these things? These are the connected components when you take the plane and take the zero set up. So in fact, these things, some of these things are exactly these patches of that group. And in some sense, we've managed to represent them in a way that doesn't really depend on A, B, and C. Because if I wiggle A, B, and C in the same cell of CAD, this picture doesn't quantitatively change. So I can actually write down in five dimensions the semi algebraic description of this object, which is all possible ABCs in this cell cross this stuff. Why is this good? Because then if someone gives me a triangle and I actually know where it ends, I can figure out which cell in CAD it corresponds to and which blob like this it corresponds to. And then this blob doesn't directly depend on the triangle. And the testing can be done by plugging in the numbers for A, B, and C. And for the, for the arc. But I no longer really need the three vertices of the triangle. Okay. I'm cutting a lot of corners, but that's the idea. And what uh, both saves us and almost kills us is that the size of this monstrous object is constant as long as the number of polynomials is constant, the dimension is constant, and the degree is constant. The dependence is horrendous. It's doubly exponential in the dimension. But the dimension is three. So what do I care? Okay, so basically we look at all possible combinations of cells in this decomposition and these little sub pieces. And we check for each uh, trapezoid, for each triangle, you know, whether this thing is inside or not. And we assign this, uh, we say, okay, for this triangle, we should um, try this patch and this patch, but not the other patch. We collect them all. That gives us a, some sort of a partition. And when, then we throw a range search. Because now we can distinguish which pieces need to be checked and which pieces don't need to be. Once we do that, we are working in the space of lines, little planes, sort of. 
because we only need to specify which plane we are in because for that triangle we already figured out what is it in. Um, I'm actually lying horribly, but uh, I'm certainly out of time. So let me just stop.